This week at Bible Center, we are so excited to have you with us today. If you are a first-time guest, you should have received a Connect card or a warm welcome in the online chat. Please fill out the connection card and leave it with one of our ushers as you exit or review the connection information on our website, BibleCenterPGH.org. Sunday, May 29th is Youth Sunday. Our guest speaker will be the Reverend Nathaniel Carter of This Generation Connect Center. Please save the date and invite a friend. On Saturday, June 11th, the Owner Owned Business Academy is hosting a pop-up mall here at the Warm Center from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Please spread the word. Bible Center Church is turning 66 years old. In celebration of our 66th anniversary, we will have a virtual revival on June 8th and 9th with guest speakers Rev. Jonathan Counts and Elder Melvin Brown. We will also have a special anniversary service on June 12th. Please put aside your BC t-shirt or Everyday Cafe t-shirt to wear on that Sunday. If you haven't made a building fund pledge, please consider giving a special offering on that day. Please stay tuned for more information. If you have children ages 5 to 11, you'll want to enroll them into our free Mega Sports Vacation Bible School, June 21st through the 23rd. Please see our Monday email for more information. Sunday, June 26th is Education Sunday. In addition to celebrating our college-bound seniors and honor roll students, we will recognize our Makers Clubhouse children and award the Priscilla Robinson Igwe Scholarship. Please set aside your favorite school gear for that day and save the date. We are able to do so many wonderful things at Bible Center and bring transformation to the Homewood community because of the faithful giving of our members and partners. We thank you all for all the ways that you support the work of the ministry. We have several ways you can give. You can give online through our website or using the Venmo app at BCPGH, or you can use a giving envelope to give in person or mail to our administration office located at 7238 Forey Way. We thank you in advance for allowing God to use you to be a blessing. As we gear up for our summer programs, we are seeking staff and volunteers. Please go to bcpgh.info forward slash careers for more information. Everyone have an amazing week. Man, thank God for the thorough announcements. <laughs> <laughs> want to thank everyone who participated yesterday. We know um, Brother Joe Simmons uh, passed, and so everybody who contributed with regard to your time, of course, thanking this Bible Center more generally for making your space available for important opportunities to support the community, right, when we can be a blessing. Uh, you have an icon. The business has been here since 1979. And his passing was a big deal. And so just want to thank all of you who uh, participated to facilitate that. The ushers were fantastic. The customer service is just beautiful. And so uh, people come in like, I remember that, you know, everything in Pittsburgh is the old. I remember the old, right? Man, y'all doing all right, right? But the beautiful thing was, again, to be able to allow people to fill the space. Everything was safe and clean and just, it was a wonderful experience. And then for folks to be able to go downstairs and have a meal. And again, it's the generosity of our people and our faith community that, um, again, supports the community. So thank you so much for that. Uh, just want to prepare for our children to be able to go to a better place. And so I want to pray for uh, the kids. As you know, a uh, long time tradition in our church has been to pray for our children. So uh, something my grandfather started many, 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 many years ago, and uh, anointing them and all of that. And so we want to continue that, pray for the children, and permit them to go to Children's Church. So please join me in prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, we come, first of all, giving you thanksgiving. We thank you, Lord God, for being God. We thank you, Father, for your love for us. We thank you, Father, that so many of us, we came to know you as children. And, Father, as we find ourselves in a very difficult situation with regard to the condition of our world, we also know that you are God. And the effort to infuse in the lives of our children and demonstrate to, the, to them your love, Lord God, is powerful. And so we thank you for the opportunity. We don't take lightly the stewardship responsibility that goes with the opportunity to pray for our children, to let them know that they are loved, Lord God, and to teach them your word. You say that you want your word placed in our children so that the children not yet born will know. So we share our stories. We tell our testimonies. We talk about what you've done, your faithfulness for us individually and collectively as a people. 
And so, Father, bless those who teach the young people. Lord God, I ask that you would just touch them. Lord God, give them to speak with accuracy and clarity. And again, to demonstrate your love for us through them. And Father, we give you name, the glory, the praise, and the honor. We pray this prayer now in the name, the power, and the authority of Jesus Christ, our King. Amen. So I'm super excited this morning. and want to, of course, welcome our folks who are uh, joining us online. Glad that you're here with us. And of course, those of you who are here in person, if you're a guest today, we hope you've been made to feel welcome. Thank you for coming. And so super excited. We have our spiritual daughter speaking this morning. I'm up here looking at her notes, going through her stuff. And I'm like, OK, all right, let me see where we're going. But uh, as you know, Leah Blotton is, is perhaps one of the best mothers in the whole world. Amen. Amen. And she loves the Lord. She's committed to his call and his purpose. You need me to do a pre-sermonic sermon, a little sing something for you? Give, give me the key of C. Not that I know a C from a G. It don't matter. I'm just playing. Come on, baby. <laughs> as you just celebrate Leah as she comes. You want to use this mic? Where's your old mic? Thank you all for coming. Uh, first, I just want to thank our pastor, Pastor John and Cynthia Wallace. They do so much great things for not just us as a church, but for our community. So can we all just give our pastors a round of applause? They do so much. They work tirelessly and effortlessly. And I don't know what was going on with Pastor, but he trusts me today, right? <laughs> so let's see. Um, right, right. He said, don't mess up. So <laughs> but today we are going to be talking about faith that moves mountains. So let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you for giving me the opportunity to be able to declare your message to your people. God, I thank you for being God. I thank you that you allow all of us to wake up this morning and have breath in our mouths, God, that we are able to sit here. We are all able to walk into this building this morning. So I thank you, God. God, I ask that you will continue to be with us, that you will continue to strengthen us. God, that you will allow the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart to be acceptable in your sight today. God, I ask that you will reveal yourself and allow yourself to be true through your word. God, that you will strengthen us in faith and give us all the faith that will move mountains. In Jesus' name, amen. So one of the uh, scriptures that a lot of people use when they talk about faith that move mountains is the scripture in Matthew 17 and 20. In this, around this time, it was when the disciples were asking Jesus, like, hey, why were you able to cast out these demons and I could not, right? And Jesus is like, you have such little faith, right? And he said, truly I tell you, if you have the faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. So when I went through today's lesson, this started out as one of the easiest message, messages I would have ever had to deliver and right. And as I started to go further, this ended up, like Brother Tony said last week, one of the hardest messages I would have ever had to deliver. When Pastor first gave me a call and he said, would you speak on um, Sunday immediately without thinking twice? I said, yes, absolutely. <laughs> what you all don't know is years ago, God told me that I would be speaking and sharing the gospel. And um, I was, I didn't even have to think about it because I knew that's what I was called to do. So before I, once I hung up the phone, I realized, I said, wait, what am I even going to speak on? I probably should have asked him a topic, right? Like, <laughs> what is it that you want me to share um, this Sunday? But I was so happy and so willing to share the gospel. I just hung up ready. God, what do you want me to speak on? What do you want me to teach? And um, one of the first things, so I had a lot of different topics in my mind. So as I'm right about to write down, God, what do you want me to speak on? I wrote, the first thing I wrote was faith that moves mountains. So <laughs> it was not just clear, but it was familiar. So I'm like, faith that moves mountains. I heard that before. I heard that word, bef uh, that phrase before. So it sounds so familiar. I went on Facebook. So this is what y'all can do. If y'all ever want to listen to a message from Bible Center, you can go to Facebook click video, and just scroll through all the videos. So I think I went all the way back to maybe like November, right? And I said, no, there wasn't a message that was on faith that moved mountains. 
Well, then I went on YouTube, and I said, maybe it was from another teacher. I know I heard that before, and I really was wrestling with it because I wanted to go back to another topic that I thought I wanted to teach on. I already had something written for that one a little bit. So I was like, oh, I kind of want to go to that. But I went on YouTube, and I did not see anything that said faith that moves mountains. So I, I really started wrestling with this thought of what am I going to speak on to faith? Well, again, years back, I asked one of my best friends, I said, uh, Tonya, God told me that I'm going to share the gospel. So if I was to ever deliver a message, what would you like? What do you think I should speak on? She said, faith, immediately. I said, oh, okay, faith. Well, a little time afterwards, there was a lady by the name of um, Dr. Christine White Taylor. She didn't know me that much at the time. This was like her second time having a conversation with me. Did not talk about what God brought me through, but she said, Leah, you're supposed to deliver the gospel. I don't know if it's at a women's conference, what, but you're supposed to. And I said, well, what should I speak on, right? Because <laughs> it, it was just weird. She brought it up, and she said faith. So as I started to think about those things, I said, oh, okay, this is going to be an easy message. Not because I'm the creme de la creme of faith messages, or not because I excel so greatly in faith, but because clearly God want me to talk about faith. So I didn't even have to, I didn't even care about what I needed to write because I said, this is God's message, not mine. I did not care. I didn't worry about it. So I wrote an outline. It is what it is. Went to bed Thursday night, smile on my face. God's about to move. Some of you online and in person, if you can recall, your text message that invited you to church was on Thursday because that was the day I just knew my outline was the outline, and this was the message that God wanted me to deliver. Friday. Friday, I started today. <laughs> Brother Tony's laughing. He, he, I, know, he, I know he know where I'm at, right? Friday, I started to dig into the message, and as I'm trying to structure it, it just Things just wasn't making sense. I tried to write a whole new message, and it wasn't making sense, and it wasn't adding up. And on Friday, that's when this became the hardest message for me to write and deliver. So I started to go over my message Friday, and as I was going through my message Friday, I started to lose faith. I lost faith in the message. And as I'm losing faith in the message and I'm trying to write other things, not only did I lose faith in the message, I started to lose faith in my ability to even deliver a message. I said, I can't even deliver a message, let alone this message. So as I started to lose faith, I, I now lost faith in the message. I lost faith in my ability to deliver the message. Then I even started to lose faith in my call altogether. I said, did God even call me to do this? I'm in over my head. Who do I think that I am? Paul knew exactly what he was talking about when he told the women to be silent. Are you kidding me right now? I had the nerve to stand up here and think I'm about to deliver a message. God didn't call me to do this. And I'm, I had to start thinking, man, what am I doing? What am I going to say? Who can I call? Man, what, what should I do? Now my chest starts to hurt. Friday night, my chest is hurting. My heart starts to beat really fast. I'm having heart palpitations. I walked in the room smiling. I came out of my room with my head down. Kids said, what we eating? Eat what you want. I don't care. Like, it was just, y'all want delivery? Do what you want, right? My head was down. I was just discouraged. And then one final thought came in my mind. And that thought was, this will be the last message that I will ever deliver. This was too hard. I was over my head. I, I don't know what I was thinking. Paul told us to be silent. <laughs> so I'm just going to fall back. And as soon as I thought that thought, it's like sometimes, you know, when an enemy is attacking you and he do too much all at once, then it's like, ah, now I know exactly what this is, right? So now I had to start, I realized I started tripping because my plan was to come before you all today and teach a message, a basic, general relatable-ish message and never teach again. My message, a message that will allow me to stand before you and take on a form of godliness and faithfulness and faith feel, a faith-filled message when I was yet faithless and discouraged. So I just ask God, how can you help me fake it through this message? Well, immediately, like I said, I started to realize what it was, so I started to reach out, and I said, someone need to pray for me, because I'm tripping. 
I'm tripping. The enemy's tripping. He's trying to mess with me. Clearly, this is a message that God wants me to deliver, to deliver. And I can't help but to think that some of you walked into here, into this room today, feeling the same way I did on Friday. You said, if I can just walk in and smile, maybe no one will know what you went through last night. You said, if I can just hold hands with my spouse and we sit next together, no one will know that we're this close to a divorce. They was ticking me. When we get in the car, it's over. But if we can just walk through and smile and act like everything is okay, no one will know. Maybe if you can just post enough smiling with the right angle and just be happy, you can pretend like you are living your best life as a Christian single and no one will know that you feel empty every single night. If you can just smile and be sociable, no one will know how depressed you felt inside. And even most importantly, some, if you can just come to church every Sunday and serve and sit in the back, no one will know that you even question the very existence of God Monday through Saturday. Walking in the house of the Lord, like Timothy 3 and 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the very power thereof. That's a very scary place to be. Some of us got so good at it that we start to fool ourselves. We, we start to pretend like everything is okay instead of allowing God to move the very mountain that is hindering us from being able to carry out his purpose. We stand back and we try to pretend and we got so good at it that we fooled ourselves. So now not only are we trying to show other people that we are taking on this form of godliness, we look in the mirror and we have the nerve to think that we are godly. Meanwhile, we have no power. So we say, God, where are you? Why are you not moving? Why are you not healing? Why are you not uh, freeing people? It's because we don't have no power. We spent too much time pretending. But if you all came in this room today and you felt like how I felt on Friday, don't worry about it. Because there is not a doubt in my mind that God will not do for you today what he did for me Friday night. Which leads us to our story today, which can be found in Mark. So in Mark, the, the uh, disciples and Jesus is start out with them standing on the Mount of Olives. So they're standing on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sends someone out to go get a donkey. He's riding through Bethany. And uh, while well, he's riding on his way to Bethany and they're holy, holy, Hosanna, they're praising God. Right. Well, when Jesus and his disciples was leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. So Jesus is hungry and afar off in the distance. He see this fig tree and this fig tree is has leaves. And the leaf looked like the tree should be bearing fruit, right? Because once the leaves come, the figs should be right behind it. And then around this time, in this season, the, the figs wouldn't be as sweet as they should be, but there should have been figs there, right? Well, when they came to the fig tree, he was able to see that it had leaves, but it had no fruit. This tree bared the image of fruitfulness, yet it yields no fruit. That's like going to Starbucks and Starbucks saying, uh, we, we're open, but we don't have no coffee. Or going to Dunkin' Donuts, and they say, we're open, but we don't, we don't have no donuts. <laughs> You're like, what in the world? Going to Kentucky Fried Chicken, and it says, we're open, but we don't have no chicken. What are you open for? Why did you bear this image that if I can come to you, I can get chicken, and when I get there, you say all you have is mashed potatoes? Are you kidding me right now? You might as well close for the day. You are not open. So we go into these places thinking that we will be fed. Meanwhile, there was no food for us to eat. We would be kind of ticked off, right? Walking, we don't have no chicken. What? So can you, you can just imagine that that's how Jesus felt when he went to this fig tree hungry and there was no figs. So now when, once he saw this, he cursed the tree and he said, no longer will you be, bear fruit ever. Not just you won't bear fruit for this season. He said, you don't get to eat ever. Not only will, if I can't eat, nobody can eat from you. That's, that's pretty much what he said, right? So as he leaves the fig tree, he starts to go on to the temple. So in this temple, now the church folks in the temple cutting up. So this was supposed to be a place where people can take refuge. This is where people can pray. This was supposed to be a safe place. Meanwhile, 
they're out here buying and selling and doing cryptocurrency, not really cryptocurrency, but they're in here doing all of these things, right? And according to Matthew 11 and 17, Jesus snaps out. He said, this house shall be called of all nations, a house of prayer, but you made this a den of thieves. The church, the temple, which was supposed to be a holy place, the place of the Father, the place that where you can find God, took on this form of godliness, but yet it was far from it. Again, Jesus was ticked off so much so that he started flipping tables. He was casting people out. He said, y'all, I can't believe you did this. And I like to think, I don't know, right? So, so let me give you a little bit of content of how I made this up. We don't know if Jesus went from the fig tree, got him a corned beef sandwich, then went to Jerusalem. But the scriptures say Jesus went to the fig tree, then the next thing you see is he's in Jerusalem. So I would like to think Jesus was not just upset, but he was also hangry. So if the tree would have did what the tree was supposed to do and produce the fruit, Jesus might have just told them about themselves gently. <laughs> but now he's he hangry. And y'all, y'all flipping out now. You flipping tables, or you—you you gotta be kidding me right now, right? But it all—it shows how we all play a part. It starts sometimes. You're like, I'm just a usher. How can I mess up or or make everything worse? It's, it start with you. A little leaven. The Bible says a, li- a little leaven leavens the whole lump. So the next morning, Jesus and Jesus and his disciples started to walk past this fish, this fig tree. And Peter saw that this fig tree was dried up from the roots up. And he's like, oh, my goodness, this, this fig tree is, is dead. And, and he calls out Jesus, Jesus, remember that tree you cursed? It, it dried up all the way from the roots. And when Peter says that, Peter's just shocked. He's like, oh, my goodness, Jesus, look what you did, right? And Jesus' response was, and this is the passage we're really going to dig into and go through for the rest of the message. And this is Mark 11, 22 through 25. Peter, look, Jesus, look what you did. You cursed the tree and it's dead all the way from the root, all in one day. And Jesus' response was, have faith in God. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes what they said will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe you have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins. So that poses a question. What, does the, what is the connection between a withered fig tree and the removal of mountains? Only thing Peter said was, God, look at this tree. It died. And Jesus' response was, have faith. So what's the connection? Well, when this statement was made, Jesus, the Lord and his disciples, they were coming towards Jerusalem from a village in Bethany. As they came to the, uh, over the Mount of Olives, they saw this beautiful temple on a mountain ridge across from Ke- the Kedron Valley from the Mountain of Olives. So just imagine, this whole story started in Matthew 1, they're on the Mountain of Olives. Right over here, now these are, this mountain's a bigger distance, but you can see the temple. So Jesus saw the temple from over there, and this temple is supposed to be the staple of religious Judaism, right? So around that time, this is the centerpiece. This is where everyone would go to uh, during Passover. This is where everyone would want to go travel to in order to have an encounter or or burn their, their offerings, right? This was right in the center of religious leaves of the nation, remembering all the fruitlessness that was going on in the midst of what is supposed to be the house of God. All this religious activity going around the temple, this temple having this form of godliness that you can even see all the way across the mountain and say, this is what the temple of God looked like. And then you go there and there's no fruit. This mountain with all this religious activity was a hindrance to the Lord's gracious ministry. In fact, 
this religious establishment opposed the teaching of Christ. They were 100% against Christ. It was a barrier, an obstacle mountain. So this mountain was not just the mountain. This was an obstacle, a barrier, something that will hinder or block the progress of God's kingdom program. Therefore, the removal of this obstacle will be like a mountain taken up and thrown into the sea. In verses 21 and 22, the Lord assures us that this is a practical application for us today as well. How often do we as believers face things that may seem unmovable? It it blocks our ability to allow God's kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. What I faced on Friday night was not just emotional. It was a barrier. It tried to block God's kingdom, not just coming today, but in my life in general. When I knew for a fact God called me to deliver the gospel and share his word every day, and I had the nerve to sit here and doubt it because of what? Because of a thought. That's why the Bible says to cast down every thought that goes against what God says over your life. So... Um, When we have these obstacles, these doubts, these discouragements, what do we do about these obstacles that hold us back from furthering our spiritual growth and our progress? Well, the verse say, pray in faith. Pray in faith. Sometimes we think we have to, you know, jump, shout, run around, do a spin, do a cartwheel, and hopefully God will allow it to happen. But the Bible says you pray, and you pray in faith. So, um... To say a mountain, I want to be clear, a mountain is different than burdens or the burdens of life or the thorns in the flesh. The thorns of the flesh is like how when Paul said, God, remove this thorn from me, and um, then he came back and said, but your grace is sufficient, right? So a thorn, a burden, those are things that God may not move away. Those are things that the Lord may allow purposefully, right, to come into our lives to increase our faith and our dependence on him. A mountain, on the other hand, these are things that hinders us and is oppositional to our uh, Christian growth that we have in, in God. We can no longer move. We can't carry out our purpose. We, it, it stops us. And, and it seems like it's unmovable, like it's not even humanly possible to move this. That is a mountain. Anything that hinders us from carrying out our purpose. Well, if that is what you have today, we have a promise in this scripture that we can claim. There is no problem that is too big or mountain that is too big that our faith does not have the power to move. So now that we know that we have this power to move these obstacles in our lives, what do we do? Well, according to Mark 11, we start with prayer. It says, therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer. So a lot of times we have these mountains and we just expect God to move them. God, why didn't you move this mountain? You know it's in my way. I'm just carrying out your purpose anyway. You know I'm just doing exactly what you told me to do. Why are you even allowing this mountain to be here? And God said, I am not. You are because you refuse to speak to it. I told you if there is a mountain in your way, you must speak to that mountain and it will be moved. Not dwell on the mountain, not sit back and cry about the mountain, not say, oh my goodness, why is there a mountain? But speak, you have the power to speak to the mountain. So God did not allow that mountain to be in front of you, you did. So now that we take responsibility in saying, oh, maybe I am responsible for allowing this mountain to drag on so long, now what? The next scripture in Mark 11 and 24 says, therefore I tell you, Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And I realized there, that's one thing that I used to struggle with was I believe God can. But what I did not believe is if God will or if he wanted to. I believe you could heal, but do you even want to heal? I believe that you could move this mountain, but do you even want to move the mountain? Well, according to Hebrews 11 and 6, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and. So it's not, it must believe that he exists. And then the next sentence uh, says, he's a rewarder of those who seek him diligently. No, you must believe that he exists and you must believe that he is a rewarder that, 
of those who seek him diligently. So if you just believe he can and you don't believe that he will for you, I'm sorry to break it to you, but you still have a lack of faith. That's why the one guy said, God, forgive me for my, like, I believe, but forgive me for my unbelief. Because it, you believe, you believe that Jesus is who he say he is, but sometimes you just struggle with, but God, will you do it for me? So if you don't believe that he will do it for you, if you don't believe that he is a rewarder for you who seek him diligently, and you wonder why this mountain is still there, you have to pose a question, God, what is it? God, God help me for my unbelief. The next thing we must do is we must forgive and abide. So Jesus tells us to forgive. Um, don't it always seem like every time Jesus tells us how to pray or every time we must overcome, he always add that little piece of forgiveness in there? Like, it's always uh, for God. So how should we, when the disciples say, how should we pray? He said, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. You know, that wasn't the prayer. What's the Lord's prayer? Somebody, our Father. Come on now, I should have wrote that down. Our Father, I thought I knew it. So that was me. Who art in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. God always add that piece of forgiveness. So even though it may be hard, even though sometimes you're, you've been in situations that may seem like this person or this thing is unforgivable, one thing you should hold in the back of your mind is me not forgiving them. Am I willing to allow it to hinder me from being able to move my mountain? Is this something that's that important? Would I allow this thing or this person or this activity to hold me back from being able to do the very thing that God called me to do? So now you hurt me in my past, and I'm going to allow you to hurt me in my future too? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. We must forgive. Unless um, we need to abide and wait. Wait. So waiting is like one of those words that I don't like. I'm someone I like to see things like up front. Here's an example. Who all uh, know microwaves are not healthy? Just raise hand. Microwaves are not healthy. Out of everyone who raised their hands that says microwaves are not healthy, who uses it anyway? Right, because it's faster. Who wants to take, we don't have the time to put it in the oven and wait. We're just going to use our microwave because we, we are able to get our food faster. We do not like to wait. Our nature is to want things immediately. So waiting, it takes this, this practice and this skill and this muscle building that we have to do to be able to wait. So when the Bible tells us to wait, Sometimes we think the Bible is telling us to just sit back and wait. We pray, we believe, we did what God told us to do, and we go on and sit down, right? But that's not what the Bible's saying. The Hebrew word for wait in Scripture is kavah. When God instructs Israel to wait, he uses the word kavah. The word kavah appears in Scripture more than a hundred times. It appears more than the word salvation and deliverance. Kava. Kava means to actively wait with anticipation, hopefully watching for God to act. So when the Bible says kava on the Lord, the Bible is saying actively continue to uh, share the gospel, continue to do what God called you to do. And in your waiting, make sure you praise him because you're waiting now, just sitting back like, God, you going to do it yet? Yeah. Now you're praising God daily. God, thank you for this mountain that will be moved because I know you're going to move it. That's the difference between people who just said a prayer and people who know for a fact that God's going to follow through with their prayer. I'm not just going to sit back and say, God, can you move this mountain? Man, I sure, let me call somebody else. Maybe they can pray for me too and help this mountain to be moved. No, 
God, can you move this mountain? And I know that you are a rewarder of me because I seek you diligently. So I thank you, God, that this mountain will no longer overcome my situation or my life. I thank you, God, because this mountain will no longer stop the progression of your will being done in my life. I thank you, God, that my children will be a blessing. I thank you, God, for the call that you have on Richard's life as a minister. I thank you, God. I thank you, God, no matter what it looks like, no matter what the culture is saying, no matter what people um, are, are doing around me, that it will not affect me because I know that when I pray every single morning that you will cover both me and my children, that we will be all right. Thank you, God. The most popular phrase or scripture that we read with the word kava is Isaiah 40 and 31. It says, those who kava upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. So that scripture is not saying, again, we, we read it and we sing songs about it and we say, those who wait. So we prayed and now we just throw it away. We prayed and we're not thinking about it no more. Mm -mm. It says, those who kava on the Lord. So I'm going to read... It the way that the definition says, those who actively wait with anticipation, hopefully watching for God to act, will renew their strength. So it's not just those who wait, it's those who actively wait with anticipation, with joy, with peace. When we walk into the house of God that we just already have a praise on our tongue, we don't have to wait for even the worship leader to sing, we walk in praising God. Because we know that it was only God who carried us through that week. It was only God the reason why we are overcomers today. It says, those who kava on the Lord will renew their strength. Uh, kava, the, the other definition, also means to abide. So a lot of times, whenever we say, why is it so hard for me to say this prayer and trust in God and believe that he will act uh, actually do these things it's because we don't know God and we don't know what he's capable of but when you are bad in the Lord you know his ways you know that at the end of the day whatever you ask in his name he will give to you because now you are his and he is yours now I don't have to second guess was my prayer was this a godly prayer or did I make this up did I ask a miss I know I didn't ask a miss because my prayer is and my will has now aligned with his will my thoughts have now aligned with his with his thoughts so everything that I ask for and everything I pray for is not a miss because I know I know God and he knows me and we are one So I just want to encourage you all that if you abide, if you love, if you trust and follow God, you will develop this faith that can move mountains. So some of you today may have heard this message and say, this sound good. This sounds like a great message. Um, it sounds like all I have to do is trust in God and I'll have a faith that moves mountains. But you still don't feel it. It's still not, you're still like, ah, I'm, I'm kind of wrestling with this. And others of you may say, I want to have faith, but I know that the greatest condition for me to be able to have this faith that moves mountains is I must believe that there is a God. I need to know who Christ is. What does it look like to follow Christ? Well, I want to encourage you all and say that you are in the right place at the right time. That right now is whenever you can take the time out and say, God, I don't know you. I don't, I don't know what it means to follow you. I think I've been following you. I've been coming into the church with this form of godliness. But you know that in my heart, I'm discouraged and I'm distraught. But God, I want to be godly. I don't know. I no longer want to pretend like I'm something I'm not. And God, today I heard that you have a, the power to help me overcome that. I no longer want to pretend. God said, all you have to do is confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he is Lord. And you will be saved. Now, now I got to tell you something. Some people said that God is their Lord. And they thought it meant that Jesus is just the son of God. Just believing that he is. And that's not what it means to make God your Lord. What it means to make God your Lord is that he is now your master. 
When he say no, you say no. When he say yes, you say yes. When he say stop. So for in order to accept God as your Lord and Savior, you must be willing to obey him. So for those of you who um, want to make Lord your Savior today, please raise your hand. For those of you who may say, hey, I'm still struggling with this, this thought of me, little old me, having a faith that actually moved the mountains that are in my life. If that is you, raise your hand. Can our um, prayer partners, if you can keep your hand up just a little bit. Those of you who are a prayer partner, can you walk over to those who have their hand raised and pray with them? Thank you, to overcome any obstacle, any stronghold, anything that is hindering us and those around us, God. I pray that you will just continue to reveal yourself to be true in our lives, God. God, that we will be able to stand firm as believers and say that we know without a shadow of a doubt that we serve a God who not just sit high and look low, but a God that is present in our lives each and every day, God. God, I pray for um, everyone who may even want to abide, but, but don't know if they can find the time or don't even know what it looked like. God, I pray that you will reveal yourself to each and every one of us. I pray that your strength and your truth will arise over anything or any thought that will hinder us from believing that you are who you say you are. I thank you, God, for your faith. I thank you that everything that we stand in need of, God, we already have. I thank you for the victory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please welcome our pastor. I asked her, what's her cash app? <laughs> Let's stand and be dismissed. May God bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. And may you be blessed this week as we utilize the faith and the power that God has placed within us to be able to move our mountains and to advance his kingdom. God bless you. Turn to the person on your left and your right. Tell them my pastor loves me. God bless you. Have a great week. <laughs>